Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com digs into what happened on the major markets this past week. He checks in on the Dow, Gold, and Crude. Author of the latest edition of When the Bubble Burst Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash, Hilliard Macbeth, talks about interest rates, the U.S.-China trade war, is Canada in a recession, and of course, real estate. The publisher of WolfStreet.com, Wolf Richter, tells us why semiconductor sales have dropped over 20%, whether the U.S. is in a recession, and discusses the American trucking industry. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray, Avon Resources President Jim Pettit, and naturally splendid co-founder Craig Goodwin. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Grand Portage Resources, Herbert Gold Project in Southeast Alaska highlights increased gold resource, indicated and inferred, of 860,000 ounces, in excess of 10 grams per ton gold. Expansion drilling is planned on the Herbert Gold property for the summer of 2019. Grand Portage Resources trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, grandportage.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Well, it's good to be back. I take a two-week breather, and uh, it's amazing how volatility came back into play. They, they knew you were away. They, they didn't dare start doing anything nasty until you came back. Now, now actually, as I said to somebody while I was away, uh, for 30 or 40 years that I've been around the industry, the odds of something big happening while I'm on holiday are about 90%. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to make sure that in the futures market we closed out all the positions ahead of time because the leverage would really get put people in trouble if I wasn't around and you know they they wouldn't you know pull out the plug uh, quickly enough so here we are i mean you know I go away vix you know the volatility index as far as the equity markets was down around 12 and a half to 13 t- testing the lows of the year and this week in money is archived so online real at talkdigitalnetwork.com the dow was sitting over 27000 spent a, a week or so up there it was you know everybody was happy we had broken out but the internals were terrible uh and there were uh hindenburg signals kicking up i think we mentioned this you got two 2.4 percent of stocks making new all-time highs at the same time you got 2.4 percent making 52 week lows so huge discrepancies within the market so the catalysts, uh, gosh, between the, the Fed rate cut, which was only the quarter point, and then Trump coming along with additional tariffs, uh, and then the, the, the yuan um, moving through seven with the Chinese uh, having taking away some of the support, not so much intervening, but taking away the support on the yuan. You know, here we were with a, a market that clearly was set up for vulnerability. And by Monday, um, the signals that we look for, you know, we, we look for exhaustion points, both on the upside and the downside. When there is a, a panic, an urgency for people to get in or out of the market, and invariably it happens around news-related events such as the sort of the three that coupled here, and you get a, a um, we look at short and intermediate-term indicators. And when you get the two of them coupled together, probability for a reversal is extremely good. So we got signals on Monday, Tuesday, uh, when the Dow was down around 2550. So it was off the better part of, what, 1800 points in a week? Um, so just a huge drop. And the probability was that we would have a good bounce back from that. Um, and you would recover 50 to 60%. As of Thursday, we had that in the S&P. You've got it in the, the Dow. You had it pretty much across the board in the broad indices. So at this point, we should be like last October or like February, March of a year ago 
where we get stuck into a choppy trading range again. So the upper end of it on the Dow is probably around, we closed the week off at 25 or 26,287. So the upper range of resistance is probably around 26,800. The bottom end, we could very easily retest the lows of this week, around 25,500, and maybe spend the better part of August just thrashing around. So that's, you know, I think the easy money was made from Monday through Thursday, and at this point you've got to be looking maybe at individual stocks because I don't think the broad market is going to do much here for the next couple of weeks. How did gold do in reaction to all of this? Well, uh, the the flight to safety clearly came into play, whether it was in gold or Bitcoin or the bond market. And so here we are, gold, um, you know, uh, last time we spoke, gold was around 1420-ish, been consolidating for five weeks. It was just kissing the 20-day moving average, which was very critical for us. It had to hold that. Uh, to maintain this uptrend that it's had since May. Um, so catalysts of the last 10 days were enough to push us up into the 1420 range. I've got all new upside, you know, overbought readings without a doubt. And wouldn't be at all surprised at this point to see that uh, as, as it is now once again susceptible to a consolidation or pullback, that it comes back maybe to test the 1440-ish range. Uh, the 20-day average is at about 1450. So um, wouldn't be at all surprised to see that. The miners, looking at the GDX and the GDXJ, um, we look at the height of the consolidation that we had in the previous six months or so, and we have now reached the magnitude of what you would expect as a normal upside move in both of those, and they're finally now showing upside uh, uh, relative strength readings that are at extremes. So uh, pullbacks there would uh, would look to be in place. We did a special piece on silver this week. Uh, silver has had a great run uh, up to 1720 on this rally. This is an important resistance level right here for silver. And uh, as I say, uh, we've done a piece there. If there's anybody who hasn't uh, had a a free look at our research in the past, they're welcome to send along a request. uh, Ross Clark at chartsandmarkets.com, and we'll send that off to them. Ross, the Iranians have seized more tankers over the last uh, few weeks. Has that had any impact on the price of crude? Well, it's it's held the price together. And when you see what's gone on with other commodities, uh, the the metals markets, you know, the base metals markets, you look at the agriculture markets, the, the oil here uh, has held up extremely well when you think about it. Uh, bottom end was at $51, closed off the week at 54 and a half. And um, this... Uh, you know, it, for all that it's not rallying, it, it is holding its uh, own reasonably well. Um, we did expect that that June low was going to be an important one. And when we pulled back down to 51, had the decent rally to six, just over 60. Um, and if it hadn't been for the weakness across the board in most markets, I think oil had a pretty good chance of holding around 55. At this point, though, I think you're probably going to have to go down and see it under 50 to produce a new lasting low to give us a better rally. Um, as I say, if all you can tack on is uh, two, two and a half dollars with the situation aggravated as it is uh, down in the streets, then um, you know there's, there's still some vulnerability here. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. And nice to be back. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Hilliard Macbeth, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. 
Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. My guest is Hilliard Macbeth, author of the second edition of the book, When the Bubble Burst, Surviving the Canadian Real Estate Crash. He's also a portfolio manager and financial advisor in Edmonton. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Hilliard. Wonderful to be back on the show. Hilliard, could lower interest rates in the U.S. delay a recession? It's hard to imagine how they would delay it. I think uh, the way the Bank of Canada, or the, sorry, the central banks generally work, and the Bank of Canada, but uh, we're talking about the U.S., is they tend to follow the economy rather than lead it. So, And there's been several studies, uh, one big one done by Richard Werner and uh, others, um, that uh, the economy weakens and then the central bank cuts rates. So the fact that they're talking, they did one small cut, and the fact that they're talking about doing several more cuts, uh, President Trump would like them to move faster, is a signal that the economy is very weak. But I don't think it'll have much impact because they really don't impact um, longer-term rates like five years, 10 years, 30 years. It's just the very short-term rates that they impact. And, and the long-term rates have already come down So and are falling. Uh, this Actually, what's spooking the markets the, the last few days is that the long-term rates have been falling quite quickly. So that's more a sense that the investors are, are sensing that the economy is going into recession. It's not a uh, um, a result of any actions by the Federal Reserve. How are lower interest rates in the U.S. likely to affect Canada? Well, Canada, it's quite interesting because we had um, we had a, quite a strong currency, quite a bit stronger than what I thought it should be, and it's because, our, of course, our central bank has been slower to cut rates. And uh, we did one uh, cut a few years ago when the oil um, market collapsed, but uh, since then, the central, our central bank, the Bank of Canada, has been talking about how strong the economy is mostly. And uh, so there's quite a discrepancy there. And, um, of course, if it, if it persisted, it would cause a recession in Canada because our dollar would rise. Uh, if, if the discrepancy in the level of interest rates persisted, um, where Canadian rates are higher and the U.S. rates are lower, then uh, that would that would push uh, Canada into recession because the Canadian dollar would rise because people would be attracted to the higher rates. And, uh, of course, we're an export-oriented economy. So we in Canada, we, we would um, our exports would start to suffer, and then uh, we'd be in a recession. So it's, uh, it's a pretty big thing, and um, uh, we have to uh, hope that, uh, that interest rates go lower in Canada at the same pace as they go lower in the U.S., could lowering interest rates now have the same effect that Japan has experienced since the early 90s, where effectively they have zero or negative rates? Well, yeah, and it, you know, it's interesting, and I put that in the book because uh, people say, oh, you know, and in fact, I, I just saw this on Twitter uh, yesterday. They say, well, as long as interest rates stay low, the, the uh, housing bubble can't burst. And now the only place left really in Canada where the housing bubble hasn't burst uh, is Toronto. And this, was, of course, was a Toronto comment. And uh, and that's just ridiculous because you look at Japan, interest rates came down um, in the early 90s and uh, went very close to zero and stayed there for 25 years. And the economy stayed weak and the housing market kept getting, uh, prices kept coming down slowly, but they came down over a 25-year period. So the interest rate doesn't is not the whole story. In fact, it's a small part of the story. If you think about it, somebody goes to the bank to get a mortgage they don't say, well, I think the interest rate's, uh, you know, 3% and I think it should be 2%, therefore I'm not going to buy that house. That's, that's the last thing they say. They, they would say, we want that house. Do we qualify? Well, as long as they qualify for the loan, they, the interest rate really isn't that important to them. What's more important, people? How much they pay per month? Yeah, and the thing is that what it comes down to is what are the rules um in terms of the lender, what are the rules about qualification? And, and they've been watered down many times over the years, uh, you know, in terms of how much income you count and how you count it. And 
and uh, the ability of the household to repay and and the um, there's several ratios that they examine and in order to keep people in the housing market as housing prices got higher and higher over the last 15 years up till 2016 um, they had to keep changing the rules and keep relaxing them and, and also how they applied the rules so so that's much more important than um, than what the interest rate is so there's no guarantee just because interest rates go down even to the negative levels that uh, the housing market will go up but uh, you know, it certainly makes it easier for people to qualify. So it could it could have that impact. I don't understand how you could buy a house with negative interest rates. Does the bank send you money every month instead of you <laughs> paying them? Well, nobody so far has said that the mortgage rates have gone negative. The some of the some of the government bond rates have gone negative. But I actually saw a, a tweet uh, from Denmark saying that somebody had actually gotten a negative interest rate mortgage, but. Then somebody else tweeted and said, yes, but there's a bunch of fees that they attach to it. So yeah, you actually, even though technically the mortgage says a negative, you know, 0.2% or something, you end up paying the bank more than the, the principal back. Of course, you always have to pay the principal back plus some extra fees that they charge. So it's, um, there's always a way for the banks to get their money. Well, in the Muslim world, it's illegal to charge interest. That's how their banks make money, right? Yeah. And what they do in the, in the Islamic, Laws. I, I understand. I haven't studied it closely, but I understand is they have other ways of participating in in the repayment. So if there's risk involved in the loan, they would take an equity position, or they would have some kind of equity related um, re- uh, bonus, let's say, um, that would reflect the risk that they're taking. So I mean, you could put all interest rates to zero tomorrow, and you go to the bank, and the bank says, yes, the the uh, that five hundred thousand dollar mortgage, there'll be a two hundred thousand dollar fee to. Uh, Put that will give you that mortgage over 25 years, and the fee up front is 200,000. That would be the the. Um, so we'll just add that to the loan, and that'll be 700,000 you owe us now. So, but you only get 500 to, to buy the house. There'd be no interest on that loan, but um, it would still be very expensive to pay it back. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth when this week in money returns. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, how could the U.S.-China trade war affect Canada? Well, it's already affecting us in terms of uh, the way the Chinese are dealing with us because uh, Canada, under the treaty, was required to arrest the CFO of Huawei. And I understand she's still under house arrest in, um, in Vancouver waiting for extradition to the U.S. And uh, China, you know, they either don't understand or they pretend to not understand that Canada didn't really have any choice and they're retaliating against Canada. So it, it's a it's a big deal. And, uh, you know, it's not really just a trade war that's happening with China. This is something that um, I've been working on, some uh, writing a piece on it, and it'll come out soon uh, in the weekly notes. Um, it's really a, a situation where an upstart, being China being the upstart, hard to imagine a culture thousands of years old being the upstart, but in this case it is, and the dominant player, which is the United States, and uh, a shift which is happening. And um, there, there was a history in uh, Greece between Sparta and Athens, and Athens was the upstart, and it triggered a war because Spart- Sparta got so worried about Athens being the ups- upstart and the fear caused them to get very paranoid and uh, and then they started a, a, a big war. So um, and so in this case we got the same situation in that uh, China inevitably is going to become a more important world player than the U.S. is as time goes by, much like happened between England and the United States um, in between 1900 and 1950. And um, and and the U.S. isn't going to like that very much, so they're going to. They're, they, I don't know if they'll start a war, but it's quite possible they will, and um, and that's what it's about. So it's going to get. It's going to even if um, President Trump and uh, President Xi uh, announce some kind of a, a, a trade deal, it'll be a very um, face-saving 
uh, agreement, which will probably have no uh, teeth in it, and uh, the dispute will continue and could very well get quite a bit worse uh, over the next 10 or 20 years as China continues to gain strength. If China continues to devalue the yuan, what's likely to happen to China's economy? Well, you know, it's it, what they, they're not really devaluing the yuan. Although the U.S. will say that they, they uh, in the, this week they um, they named them a currency manipulator. But really, what was happening was the yuan the yuan was weak, and um, and the Chinese were not intervening to support it. So the the max the max uh, magic number was seven seven yuan, yuan to one U.S. dollar. And so at the higher number means the yuan is weaker. And as it went through seven, it got to 7.04. Um, the Chinese didn't act like they normally would have in the past to bring it down to 6.9 again, uh, bring it up, up, strengthen it to 6.9. And they let it weaken to 7.04. And that's what caused the big furor. And it'll help their economy a little bit, the exports. But you know, there's a misconception about China. Um, uh, that all, all of us, a lot of us were, were laboring under, including me, which was their export economy is not nearly as important as, as we thought. It's, um, the exports to the U.S. are under 5% of their GDP. They, they, uh, they have a lot of room domestically to, uh, to, uh, build infrastructure, to increase consumption from the Chinese, the average Chinese consumer. It's got a lot of room to lower their savings and increase their spending. So they're not, they're not going to be um they're going to, not going to be devastated if um if the china trade war hurts them but but the um i mean it'll be tough on their economy but they will survive it and um the weakening of the yuan from 6.9 down to 7.1 or 7.2 or even 8 isn't going to change that very much is a lower yuan an incentive for people for mainline china to sell their real estate holdings around the world and bring their money back to china you know, I haven't heard it. Uh, that's a great question. I haven't heard it asked that way. The other, the way that all of the Chinese realtors, uh, sorry, the the Vancouver realtors um, are portraying it is, with the weakening yuan, the Vancouver housing market will turn and go up again. And I heard this from um, some people from Hong Kong who live in Edmonton, actually, uh, saying that there'll be an even bigger rush to get the money out of China. So if it goes to seven. They're going to assume eventually it's going to go to ten or fifteen, and they want to get their money out as fast as they can. So I don't think it'll it'll be uh, something that would bring money back to China. I think it'd be more likely to increase the exodus of money out of China. But I think what's happened is um, they were they wouldn't have allowed the um, the yuan to uh, to weaken if they weren't pretty confident about their credit controls. You know the rules are in place, and what was missing was the enforcement of the rules. Uh, and um, I guess they, the authorities in China must think that they've got um, a much better handle on 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 restricting the flow of money out of China, and uh, I think they probably uh, have accomplished that. So, um, so the panic that you normally would see when the yuan weakens, you know, may, the panic may still be there, but people will find they aren't able to move the money out as, as easily. We'll have more with Hilliard Macbeth when This Week in Money returns. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Hilliard Macbeth. Hilliard, is Canada in or headed for recession? Well, you know, the numbers on the surface show a very strong economy, and uh, there's uh, great employment growth and a low unemployment rate, much as uh, much as there is in the U.S. And uh, But... I think the the reality is that the housing bubble has burst uh, is, is in the is in the process of bursting, and uh, the real estate economy is uh, the real estate is a much bigger part of the economy than it's ever been before when we've been entering into a recession. So we'll find out if that's enough to tip it over to recession. And on and then on the um, Alberta front, which people 
in the East uh, aren't aware of how important the Alberta economy is to Canada. And I'm not I'm not just entering into a pipeline rant here. I'm just stating the facts that um, uh, Alberta has about 22% of GDP with only 11% of the population. So it's a very significant uh, part of Canada, and uh, the economy in Alberta is very weak. So uh, it has been in and out of recession for the last five years several times. And um, so the combination of those things, it's hard to imagine that um, something like car sales or or lumber exports would be enough to counteract those two areas of weakness. Uh, car sales, for example, um, in Canada, car sales have been weakening for 16 months in a row now. And in the U.S., um, the, there's, the, the rate of sales of cars in the U.S. is still very high, around 17 million but it, it, it is sign, showing signs of uh, weakening significantly. It's partly just uh, the economy, partly uh, consumer debt, but it also could be the um, people are confused about whether they should buy another um, combustion engine car or whether they should look at electric cars. Where in the real estate bubble burst cycle are the various parts of Canada? So the... The western cities like Edmonton, Calgary, Vancouver, um, they're all, you know, well into the, into the bursting, uh, segment of the cycle. Um, Saskatoon, Regina, Winnipeg, uh, there's quite a bit of weakness there as well. In Toronto, the headline that came out this week was that, uh, house prices had, had uh, moved up slightly year over year and, uh, sales had bounced 24%. But of course that, that volume of activity was from a very low level. But the other thing that the article didn't say, uh, although it, if you read if you read all the way to the end of the article, there was one sentence in there that said that single family detached homes in the, in the segments of Toronto are still quite weak. And um, the actual numbers are in the 416 area code in Toronto, uh, prices have come down more than nine percent year over year. So that isn't that isn't necessarily a crash, or it's not a big enough drop to be a crash, but it, it's not getting the attention it deserves because. The same thing happened in Vancouver for for a while. Um, the condo market kept going up with pre-sales for new buildings, and there's a tremendous amount of uh, new buildings for condos in in Toronto with pre-sales, and they keep jacking the price up on the pre-sales. But uh, but the the single-family home is a segment to watch. So if you, so Toronto's really the last Toronto, I guess Montreal as well. Montreal's a different market. It's quite it's always been quite weak, and it's showing a bit of signs of strength, but. Toronto is the main area that's sort of a question mark over it, but I would say if you if you looked at the single family detached homes, you could see clearly that it peaked in the spring of 2017, and so now we're more than two years into the um, into the correction. But you couldn't call it a bubble bursting yet. There has to be uh, more things like in West Van, where prices have come down 40 or 50 percent in some cases, to say that the bubble is bursting. High-end real estate in Vancouver topped in the spring of 2016. How long is it going to take the high-end market to bottom? Well, it's been a, a few weeks since I looked at the number of listings, but um, a few weeks ago I looked and there was more than 250 homes for sale in uh, West Van, North Van area uh, at $3 million or higher. And it's just, I mean, it's never happened before. And uh, without the uh, Chinese... Um, investor uh, money coming in and without the money laundering money coming in from wherever it comes uh, both of those uh, sources of money seem to have completely dried up uh, there, there, there's just not enough people in Vancouver to buy those homes it, the average person or even the high income person really doesn't uh, find it uh, very attractive to pay more than three million dollars for a home so so it, it, it's probably in like in the third or fourth inning of a uh, nine inning baseball game. Uh, we've got quite a bit more to, uh, to see in, in the U S it took um, about five years to bottom. So if we're talking 2016, we got, we're three years into it and we got two more years to go without, that would probably make sense. I think somewhere, but our bubble, the bubble in Vancouver is arguably the biggest bubble in the world. So it might be uh, more, more, uh, drawn out and take a little bit longer than than what happened in the U.S. What do you see ahead for the Canadian and U.S. dollars? Well, you know, the dollar is, um, you always, when you talk about currencies, you have to talk about um, the pair, right? So if the Canadian dollar is weak, people don't say it, but what they mean is it's weak against the U.S. dollar. 
and um, and vice versa. And so, if you look at the euro or the yen, um, or one of the one of the interesting ones that's kind of neutral is gold. So, if you look at gold, it's always priced in U.S. dollars, and it's around fifteen hundred dollars a ton now, or an ounce, sorry, an ounce. And uh, that's a move up from a thousand dollars an ounce uh, a few years ago. Uh, so it's been kind of like the quiet move that's happened, and now it's starting to get a little bit of attention. But people lost completely lost interest in gold for a long time. The the Central Bank of Canada sold all of their gold reserves. We used to we we have more gold mines per capita than any country in the world, and uh, for some reason they decided not to hang on to their gold reserves. China is is uh, rapidly amassing gold reserves. Uh, I think they bought something like eighty four tons of gold in the first six months of 2019. So if you take if you take the gold price as the inverse of the currency, so in other words, um, you could say that the U.S. dollar has weakened from one thousandth of an ounce of gold to one one thousand five hundred of a of a ounce of gold. So it's a it's a weakening of um, on that and that thing. Uh, you could say a a fifty percent weakening uh, in the price of gold. And Canada would be similar because our our dollar has stayed uh, similar to uh, to the U.S. dollar over the last couple of years so so uh it's hard to say i think um in the long run the uh, the uh you know the canadian dollar and the and the, especially the canadian dollar should be weaker um and the u.s dollar as well in the long run but the problem with the u.s dollar in the short run is that when there's a crisis if there's a, some kind of stock market crash or or some other crisis with the trade war or something else happens um the U.S. dollar always strengthens because people run back to the safety of the U.S. dollar. They're not, by the way, they're not, um, and this is, this is somewhat new. The Canadian dollar is not reacting as a safe haven as it has in the past in, the, in this uh, stock market volatility we've had, we've had the last, um, few, uh, few days and the talk about a recession and the interest rates going worldwide going much lower. Um, every time there's more, more fear into the market, the Canadian dollar weakens. So, People are not looking at to the Canadian dollar as a place to go and park their park their safe money. Um, so that that means the U.S. dollar will will be, be even stronger relative to the other currencies if um, if it's the only safe haven around other than gold. Why are gold and silver on the move? Well, there you have it. I mean, people are worried about currencies and um, they start to move it. And you know, for instance, I mentioned the eighty-four uh, tons of gold in China that have been bought, you know, the, if the Chinese person is afraid that the yuan is going from seven to one dollar to maybe 10 to one dollar, that'd be a devaluation of, of, uh, 35, 40 percent. Their other option, if they can't get their money out and buy Vancouver real estate anymore, uh, their other option would be to transfer it into gold and then they wouldn't be affected by, um, the government letting the yuan weaken. So, that's probably why the um, the gold market is moving. It's not because there's any inflation in the world. There's obviously no um, sign of inflation anywhere. It's more of a of a um, a fear of uh, of risk and a fear of of uh, instability with paper currencies like the U.S. dollar and and uh, other currencies. So um, it's actually quite interesting that gold is is uh, so strong. And I haven't been following silver closely, but I'm I'm sure it is also strong as well. Is oil likely to move higher with gold and silver? Well, it sure has been weak lately. Uh, there was a, there was a report out um, uh, this week uh, on Thursday that said that the Saudis had been talking to the other members of OPEC um, to try and stop the slide in the price of oil. So the, the price of oil is they they look at uh, we tend to look at um, the West Texas Intermediate, but the Saudis tend to look more at the at the uh, the European benchmark, and um, so in that case, that one's gone down. I think uh, probably more than twenty percent in the last six months. So they're quite worried about that. But uh, uh, I don't think there's anything they can do. I wrote a weekend note um, in December of 2014 when the oil thing first hit in Canada, saying that OPEC had lost control of the market, and I I think uh, they still keep having meetings and they still keep trying to. Uh, to do stuff, but, uh, you know, Russia's not a member of OPEC, uh, the U.S. is not a member of OPEC. Uh, those are the two biggest producers in the world now, the U.S. being number one and Russia being number two, Saudi's number three. 
Canada's right in there. Canada's not a, a member of OPEC, so so uh, OPEC's uh, losing its. Uh, and then two of the major uh, people in OPEC, uh, the Saudis and Iran, are are, are uh, bitter enemies now. So um, so I don't think there's much that they can do to support the price of oil. So I and I would think that the price of oil, if we get a recession, which is what I think the lower interest rates are, are telling us that it is coming in both the U.S. and Canada. Um, one of the things that happens in a recession is the demand for oil uh, plummets. So in this market, with the demand for oil plummeting and uh, more and more supply coming out of uh, the U.S., in, in mostly from Texas, um, it's got the makings for a pretty significant drop in the price of oil. Is the electric vehicle revolution growing? Well, it's hard to say, you know, <laughs> like I... I, uh, I, um, I know that, uh, when you look at the sales, so in Europe they reported the sales of the Tesla. Um, uh, it's the only car so far, the Tesla Model 3, that's got any significant number of sales in Europe, which is surprising because there's a couple of European cars that are out. The Audi, uh, e-tron is out and the Jaguar I-Pace is out, but the number of sales is, is pretty dismal. Um, the Tesla Model 3 outsold the BMW and uh, several of the Mercedes models uh, by quite a wide margin in the first six months of the year. So um, it looks like it's gaining uh, gaining strength. And then, of course, the big question mark to answer that question properly is what happens in China. So China produces about 50% more cars annually than um, than the U.S. At 24 million cars is what they're producing. And uh, uh, now I don't know the exact number, but a, a much higher percentage of, of of those 24 million are electric in China than than the the very small amount in the U.S. So so it'll be more a, a, it'll be more a China story, maybe a European story, if the electric car revolution really gains momentum. But it certainly does look like it's not losing momentum. Um, and of course, the percentage numbers, like sales, are up 75 percent or something. Those are, you know, you can't really go entirely by that because the the uh, the base number is so small. So if um, if you sell four cars and then you sell seven cars, well, then it's a 75% increase, but it's still a very small number. So, um, but if it continues to grow at 75% or 100% a year for several years, then we'll have to uh, say that the um, the electric car movement is is uh, is gaining strength and I think it's already clear that it's here to stay it's just uh, the big question mark to me is what happens in this next recession which appears to be fairly imminent um, what you know do electric car sales plummet along with the, the all car sales uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens well of course too in the Vancouver area we had a dollar 78 a liter for gasoline for premium it was uh, over two dollars a leader at that price, people really do look at electric cars. Yeah, and if if so, if there's a recession, as I mentioned, the uh, price of oil usually plummets, and therefore the price of gasoline comes doesn't. You can never say the price of gasoline is going to plummet because it never seems to come down as much as it should, but it'll come down. And then that the that if that's the reason people are looking at um, electric cars, they might slow down. But there's a whole bunch of other reasons why people look at electric cars. So. Um, uh, maybe it, well, we don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. I, I think one thing for sure in a recession is that people will just delay, um, buying a car. Uh, and of course there's this whole other thing about where people decide they don't want to have a car at all. They're just trying to get by without a car. Use Uber and Lyft and then maybe eventually autonomous cars where you just, you know, do something with your app on your phone and the car, the driverless car shows up, you jump in and then goes to where you want and then you jump out. And, um, why would you own a car in that scenario? That's sort of, uh, to be a real luxury to own a car in that situation. Are we heading for a commodity bull market? Well, we certainly, if you look at gold, we're definitely in one. Uh, but if you look at oil, uh, and some other commodities, you're, we're, we're, it's pretty sad. So, uh, I don't think you can lump all the commodities together. I don't, I don't know if you ever can lump all the commodities together, but, um, the, um, the lack of inflation, uh, is generally not helping commodities, but the extremely low interest rates does help economy, uh, commodities because, uh, it, the cost of owning a commodity is, is shrinking rapidly to zero. So, um, 
And then, of course, if real estate, for whatever reason, turns out not to be the safe haven that people thought it was, then where are they? If they want to get out of paper money, where are they going to park their their money? If real estate is no longer the thing that works, then um, then commodities might uh, might get a new lease on life. They've been pretty, but the but the the history over fifty, a hundred years is is very poor for commodities. The 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 price adjusted for inflation has been coming down of copper and iron ore and all these different commodities because. The cost of getting them out of the ground has um, has come down, and the cost of finding the the deposits has come down. So, it's been a it hasn't been a great uh, thing over the long run to own commodities without you know without any income attached to it. Where can people buy the latest edition of your book when the bubble bursts, surviving the Canadian real estate crash? They can order it from Amazon. They can order it from um, other online uh, sales. Uh, and then they can also go directly to the bookstores. Um, all of the bookstores generally have them, have the, have a copy. And it's the second edition that you want to go for. And it's got red on the cover. So look for the cover that has some red coloring on it. And it says second edition. And that'll be the one to get. Hilliard, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you for listening. My guest has been Hilliard Macbeth. Coming up, Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Welcome back to the show, Wolf. Thanks for having me back, Jim. Wolf, global semiconductor sales have plunged in recent months. Why is that? Yeah, That's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, They're down and they have been down in the last five months, uh, about 22% from uh, the peak last October. And the peak was really the end of a fairly uh, long spike uh, that started sometime in 2017. And uh, when you look at the chart, you know, you, you see the, the surge in semiconductor sales that lasts for like a year and a half. And then it's just a straight line down, essentially, and it's it's been down and staying down. Uh, they're now back at uh, 2016, 2017 levels. Um, so there's 22% plunge in semiconductor sales that's been going on now for for months, uh, compares to a 39% plunge during the financial crisis. Now during the financial crisis, semiconductor sales just sort of fell off a cliff, and uh, like within a few months. You know, and then bounced off instantly. It's a perfectly V-shaped recovery, and a few months later, they were back up where they'd been. So this was just a uh, the financial crisis was just a disturbance of financial confidence. You know, when you think uh, you know, that your bank might not be open tomorrow, you, you're going to cancel your orders and see what happens. You know, and then once people figured out that's not going to happen, things sort of went back to normal. And uh, this time around. There is no sign of a V-shaped recovery. You know, and during the financial crisis, there was one month that was really low, and then the next month it started bouncing back up. So you had this just a very sharp V in the chart. Uh, this time around, it's been five months in a row at these very low levels after plunging this far and very suddenly. So it's a very different scenario. So this is not a confidence type scenario. This is a there, there's some real issues there. And so, uh, uh, you know, the semiconductors go into everything. So they go, if you buy a hair dryer today, there's going to be a chip in it. And if you buy a toaster, it's going to have a chip in it. And anything and everything that you buy uh, has semiconductors in it. And, and the, you know, the software that, that governs different things. And, and a lot of products have a lot of uh, different chips, you know. And, and, and among the the the, car, the products that have the most chips are are cars, and, uh, and they have chips for everything. And you know, they have the whole engine management system, 
You've got, you know, automatic transmissions are governed that way. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the emission control system is governed. So you have, the, I mean, little things like uh, windows and door locks. I mean, it's everything is it's, it's electronically governed these days. And uh, there are specialty manufacturers that make those chips that go into everything. And car sales are now down. And car sales is a big part of the global business. And uh, they have plunged in China, the largest market. They're down 12% in China. They're down so year over year. They're down in the U.S. for the third year in a row, not by much, but, you know, by a couple of percentage points. Uh, but, you know, it's the third year of declines. Uh, in India, which is like the fourth largest market, uh, car sales have plunged. They have to essentially collapsed by 25%. You know, yeah, because now they have a uh, shadow banking financial crisis going on. The shadow banks are really heavy into to financing vehicles, and that, uh, yeah, that system is now uh, uh, very vulnerable. And uh, so, auto sales have just collapsed in India. Uh, in Europe, auto overall in Europe, auto sales are down about three percent in uh, year over year. In Canada, auto sales are down about five and a half percent year over year. Uh, so it, it's global, and there are not many countries where auto sales are actually up. And most of them, and in most of the larger markets, you know, the, the sales are down. And this has an impact on component makers and, and on everybody in the industry, and, and and therefore semiconductors. And that's a that's a fairly new phenomenon. You know, that has nothing to do with the trade wars or anything. That's a phenomenon that started late last year uh, when. Uh, vehicle sales in China started heading south in a very hard manner. In India, it's uh, uh, something that started this year. Uh, in Europe, it's been going on for a while. In the US, it's been three years. So, you know, this is not something that, that that's unrelated to the trade wars. This is just uh, a, a maturing market globally uh, and has its own problems. So that's a, that's a big problem. And, that, and that's not going to get solved anytime soon. Then, uh, Another place where chips are used heavily and there's a lot of uh, products out there is the smartphone sales. And smartphone sales globally are now on the decline. Uh, yeah, last year they were stagnating, maturing business. This year they're in decline. And uh, in the EU by 5% and North America, so that includes the US, Canada and Mexico by 4%, uh, you know, and Japan by over 6%. And, and these are pretty big declines in China, so it, it um, uh, that takes some of the demand off the table for chips. Uh, PCs and laptops, uh, they're a big uh, uh, destination for chips. Uh, the first quarter, they were down pretty sharply. In the second quarter, they ticked up a little bit. And now we've got the Microsoft uh, Windows 7 going out, so there's an upgrade cycle going on. Uh, so PC laptop sales will likely be pretty decent. They've been languishing for a long time. You know, that, that's uh, the, the whole industry is waiting for for uh, the next operating system uh, to to become uh, unsupported, which forces people to uh, to upgrade. So that's not happening finally. And global IT spending is uh, for hardware is also down. Is expected to fall further. Software spending is good, but hardware se- hardware spending that's where the where the chips go into, um, that's in trouble. Natalie says also with the, the Chinese uh, trade war debacle, so we've got a lot of problems with Huawei. Huawei uh, is a big uh, consumer of uh, chips, and you know, the, the export controls have hit that company really hard. And then before that, last year, that happened in actually in late 2017, early 2018, and mid-2018, that uh, crypto mining... Uh, Industry got hit hard. They overproduced uh, chips for these crypto mining rigs. Was a specialty uh, computers designed to to mine cryptocurrencies. Uh, that whole thing collapsed last year, and there's a huge pile of inventory out there that hadn't been used. So that that whole thing is is, is gone. And uh, and he added off it's a it's a large amount. And so that some of the some of the declines are structural. But there's another uh, issue there, and and uh, in uh, in anticipation of the uh, tariffs uh, and the uh, export controls, companies around the world, so on both sides of the Pacific, and the United States and China and everywhere, they have stocked up on products trying to front run the tariffs and trying to front run the export controls. 
So Huawei, for example, has stored stock up to one year's worth of uh, chips and other essential components uh, ahead of time so that when the export control said it as it expected, uh, it wouldn't run out of uh, out of components. So this all happened in uh, starting in like 2017 and 2018. Uh, late 2018, that buying to stock up stopped, you know, and then some of the tariffs hit and, and uh, some of the export controls not hit. So uh, these purchases have stopped, and, uh, and and these companies are now trying to whittle down the inventories. In the United States, it's the same thing. Our like warehouses are full. Our uh, inventory measures that have boosted GDP uh, all year, uh, last year and, and earlier this year, they, they continue to grow as people were stocking up on goods, or people meaning, meaning companies were stocking goods in order to front run the potential tariffs. And uh, that has run its course now. So, uh, um, and these goods are, are things that have semiconductors in them. And, the, you know, the U.S. warehouses are just packed full of stuff. And uh, uh, so this was a, uh, in part, was a front-run operation that uh, that caused the spike in semiconductor sales last year in, 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 in late 2017. And that is being unwound now. So there's not a collapse of the economy. We have some structural issues with cell phones declining and cell phone sales and, and auto sales declining and uh, globally and, and some other tech products declining. But then we also had the, the spike last year caused by front running tariffs that is now being unwound. Uh, and the chips is a, a good indicator for what's going on in the, in the goods producing uh, economy. And uh, so we've seen that in other parts in the transportation sector and so forth. There's a fairly significant weakness as really fat inventories and a fairly significant weakness in, in current sales. Um, and, and the chip sales are just exaggerating that. I mean, they're, they're just really on top of the food chain there. And and, um, and there, you, you can really see where, where, where it's at. We'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, given all this uh, recent talk about recession, how are U.S. consumers holding up? U.S. consumers are about 70% of the economy. So that's really key. And it's very hard to get a recession in the United States without uh, consumers cutting back in some way. You know, So if you, if you have stagnating consumer spending, so no, no growth, and you have a decline and a major decline in business investment and then some other activities, uh, then you could have a recession. But as long as consumer spending grows, it's very really difficult to, to get a recession here. And consumer spending has been growing at a rate of about 4% year over year uh, the last few months. So, uh, you know, that's that's right in the, in the middle of the range uh, of, the, of the past many years. It's, it's not as strong as, uh, as last year in, uh, in August, July, August. The summer of last year was just a spike in consumer spending. That has cooled off. There was a slowdown late last year. But now it's, it's back to the, kind of the average growth rate over the last many years at around 4%. So that's pretty good. We, yesterday we got the, the consumer, uh, credit numbers, uh, for, for the second quarter. And um, they're very interesting. Yeah, you know, the uh, American consumers have gotten crushed by by debt during the financial crisis, and uh, many uh, households lost their homes, uh, credit cards. Uh, yeah, people lost their credit cards. They defaulted on them, and and yeah, you know, they defaulted on their car loans. And it, it was uh, the financial crisis was really tough on consumers, and so consumers learned a lesson. It seems in in some parts. So overall, consumer credit. And so that consumer debt uh, rose to about 4.1 trillion U.S. dollars in the quarter. That's a that's a record, uh, and that's up 54 uh, percent from the peak before the financial crisis. We've had about 17 percent inflation since then, and we've had about 8 percent population growth since then. 
sell on a per capita on an inflation adjusted basis, that increase uh, is uh, you know, is pretty significant. It's about about half of that. Now there is an interesting division because the the place where it is increasing tremendously is in student loans, and that is a catastrophic situation. Student loans are now a 1.6 trillion dollars out of that 4.1 trillion. 1.6 trillion in student loans, and uh, uh, so that's well over. So it's the largest category of consumer uh, debt that we now have, and it's up 125 percent from uh, 10 years ago. Uh, yeah, that's when you look at the chart. It just goes. It's just a diagonal line that relentlessly keeps growing, and uh, yeah, it, it, this is a big problem. In terms of the, the other two categories of uh, consumer credit, so the overall consumer credit does not include mortgages. That's a, uh, yeah, that, that's a, that's measured separately. So housing-related debt is not included here. This is just consumer consumption credit, so to speak, money that uh, consumers borrow to, to spend. And uh, it, it comes to uh, three ca- categories, and revolving credit, so that's credit cards and personal credit lines. And, uh, auto loans, and then student loans. Those are the three categories. And in credit cards, that, that was a real problem before the financial crisis and during the financial crisis when they blew up. And, uh, consumers did learn the lesson. Now, uh, credit cards, credit card balances are starting to run at a record again after plunging. Now, it's consumers deleverage. So they're up about 5% from where they were a decade ago. So, you know, at the same time, Population grew eight percent and seventeen percent inflation. So if you if you average it out on a per capita inflation adjusted basis, consumers owe a lot less on their credit cards now than they did uh, ten years ago. So this is no longer a worry. The credit card issue overall has moved off the worry list. But the thing is, a lot of Americans have credit cards that they uh, never have balances on. They use them as a payment method, but they pay them off every month. And so you don't pay interest on it. Uh, you get the loyalty benefits, so you get the cash back and the frequent flyer miles and whatever else, but you don't pay interest, and you have the money in the bank to pay it off every month. And a lot of Americans do that. That's a big part of uh, for the, you know, the Americans. And there are no risk at all. There's no debt involved. They're not, these numbers are not included because there's no interest-bearing debt. There's no balance on these credit cards. What we're looking at that... Uh, one trillion dollars in credit card debt. That's people with actual interest-bearing uh, debt on their credit card. So these are credit cards where, where consumers are paying 15 or 18 or 25 percent interest on their balances. They cannot pay them off because you know, they don't have the money to pay them off. They just make minimum payments or make some kind of payment on them, and uh, that's the, the the bifurcation here in the in American society. And these are people with limited incomes. They overspent. Yeah, you know, they. They uh, they want to buy a couch and they use the credit card to buy their couch, but they don't really have money to pay it off over the next few months, so they keep making very large interest payments on that. And uh, this group of Americans, they're the ones that owe the one trillion. So it's really a much smaller part of the population. It's a part of the population that doesn't have enough income and uses the credit cards to uh, to make up for that lack of income. So the the overall uh, vulnerability is much higher than what it looks like when you when you look at the averages, and that's how always credit cards blow up. I mean, credit cards are very risky for banks. That's why they charge uh, they're unsecured. You know, the consumer defaults on the credit card. The recovery is very little for a bank. They can't reprocess anything, and and you know they can try to to garnish wages and do those kinds of things. And but it's very tough to collect on a credit card. So. Banks charge a lot of interest on us to make up for the risk. So it's a good business for the bank, you know, that, and they're going to take some big losses. At the same time, you know, it's it, that one trillion dollars is owed by the weaker segment of the U.S. Uh, of U.S. consumers. The weaker segment meaning people that have jobs, they make money, uh, but they spend more than they make, and they they can't really pay off the credit cards. They can't pay off the debts very easily, and that that's who owes that one trillion dollars. And so at the next downturn, when some of these people lose their jobs, the first thing they'll do is they'll default on their credit card. So we know that's coming. Uh, <clears throat> credit card defaults, are, uh, delinquencies are already rising. 
So, uh, uh, you know, unemployment is, is at near historic lows in the United States, so the downturn really hasn't started. But the, and this is a kind of unusual in that credit card delinquencies are rising now that even though the downturn hasn't started yet. But uh, it's a relatively small part of the population that is very heavily exposed, and that's how that washes out. In uh, terms of auto loans and leases, it's a little different there. Yeah, now we have uh, uh, leases, and leases are uh, for everybody. So a lot of people see advantages in leasing. They could pay cash for the car, but uh, they see an advantage in leasing the vehicle, so they lease it, and there are no risks. And uh, so auto loans and leases now, the balances are $1.2 trillion. That's a record. But a big part of that is very low risk uh, customers, uh, and there, there are no issues. The issue is in subprime, and uh, that's where all of the problems are. Subprime delinquencies are very high. Uh, so about 21% of the auto loans that are being issued this year are uh, to subprime customers. Subprime uh, meaning credit scores of about uh, FICO scores of about 620 or below. And the default rates started ticking up in 2014, 2015, and by 2015 reached uh, levels that were higher than during the financial crisis. And uh, that that was just really it hit these specialized auto lenders that deal with these subprime auto loans very hard. Uh, some of them uh, went out of business last year. The industry has since tightened up its lending standards on subprime, and that's one of the reasons why auto sales are down in the United States, because the subprime-ready customers have trouble buying a new vehicle. They're, they're being uh, pushed into used vehicles, into cheaper used, used vehicles, so that, that uh, customer base has moved uh, away from new cars. Uh, the default rates, the delinquency rates have now stabilized. Uh, this year and last year, but at very, very high levels. So they're, they're still at financial crisis levels, but they have stabilized. They're not, no longer shooting higher. And that's the vulnerability in, uh, in auto loans. It's a subprime customer. So it's, uh, it's about 20, 21 percent, uh, of the loans. Uh, you know, when they default, there is recovery. Unlike a credit card, you know, you can repossess the car and, and the lender usually knows where the car is and it's easy to pick up. And, uh, uh, but their, you know, the amount of the loan on the car is usually much, much higher than the wholesale value of the car after they repossess it. So they're looking at a 40, 50, 60, or 70 percent loss, but they get something back on those, you know. And, uh, uh and, and those, those problems are very high right now and have stabilized at very high levels, um, even though there's no downturn. <laughs> So that's uh, that's the thing, you know. Last time during the financial crisis, they or before the financial crisis, they spiked as people were losing their jobs. Here they spiked in this era. They spiked uh, uh, because people just borrowed too much, bought too much car, couldn't make the payments. They didn't lose their jobs. Unemployment is just very low. Uh, it, yeah, it's not a downturn that causes them to do to be delinquent on their car loans. It's just that the industry got too greedy. The, they charged too much interest. Those loans weren't. It wasn't feasible for these companies, for these uh, guys to, to pay back those loans, and and you know that's what you get. Subprime auto loans carry interest sometimes of 15, 18, 20 percent. When a new car loan is, you know, three percent, three and a half percent. So uh, you know you get these these poor folks into vehicles that can't afford, and and you're you know, sort of planning for a, a default on that loan, and that's where the vulnerabilities are in the auto loan sector. It's a small part. Uh, and it's already falling apart, and they're they're trying to stay on top of it right now. Uh, during the next downturn, when it comes from people are losing their jobs, um, yeah, that will take a much bigger hit. So we'll look at the delinquency uh, rates that are uh, astronomical if we if, if we get a, a downturn in the labor market, especially the prime car loans. They didn't really uh, cause a lot of problems through the financial crisis. Uh, and they're very low. The historically, the, the default rates are not historically low level. So I, I don't think that's going to be an issue there. The issue is going to be with subprime. And the third element is uh, the is the student loan part at 1.6 trillion dollars. That's up 125 percent from from 2009. Uh, this is a huge issue in the United States, and that's a political issue now. It, it's it's playing into the presidential primaries. Um, 
I call it the university corporate financial complex. Yeah, you know, because the students are just a conduit uh, for these for this money. Yeah, they they get the government guaranteed money and they spend it. So they're recipients. The recipients are the universities. The recipients are the investors in an asset class called student housing. The recipients are companies like Apple and textbook publishers that uh, that cater to students, and then you know other participants in the economy like grocery stores and 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 you know clothing. Uh, companies and so forth, and uh, uh, you know, it's every dime of, of of these student loans are spent, so they're really important to the economy. You know, it's a lot of money that's being spent. But these students come out of universities with liberal arts degrees or some other degrees that they really can't make a lot of money with, and they owe fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars, and have no real way of of paying it back. Uh, at the same time, you know, they're talking about forgiving student loans. But the real problem is that this whole setup, this whole university corporate financial complex, they're just leeching off of this. And, uh, you know, the, the students are just the pipeline and that there's money. They, they, it comes from the government, you know. And, uh, uh, and it's a really unsavory situation. Uh, the, the political discussion doesn't really address it properly. It's not about loan forgiveness. That's the issue. It's, it's how the whole system works, how this money gets spent. Why, why these things are even set up that way? I mean, these are the issues we should be talking about as a, as a society. And you look at the chart, there's no slowdown. You know, if, if this keeps going another 10 years, there'll be three trillion dollars in student loans outstanding. And there's no way anybody can ever pay this much debt back. It, it's just, it's just not working. You know, this is just ridiculous. At the same time, you know, this goes is consumer spending. You know, it's part of why consumer spending grows. All of these, these amounts of money go into consumer spending, every dime of it, of this borrowed money, and, uh, you know, it contributes about 1% to GDP a year, this borrowed money that, that consumers uh, borrow on their credit cards, their student loans, and their auto loans. So it's a significant amount. And economists want consumers to borrow and spend this money, but at the same time, when you look at the auto loans on the subprime side and on student loans um, and on credit cards, too, on the... Uh, where the risky customers are, uh, you know, we have some uh, some big issues and some big problems, and the next downturn is going to be uh, it's going to be a little rough, you know, because you, these people can't they won't be able to make those payments. Wolf, how is the U.S. trucking industry doing? Yes, as we mentioned before uh, just a minute ago, uh, the the good sector of the economy has has taken some hits, you know, in part because of the inventory situation. And uh, the, the the front running of the tariffs and, and those kinds of things. So now we have this year all year long we've had a slowdown in shipment volume, and the slowdown in shipment volume uh, came after a an incredible boom in, in not only shipment volume but also in the in the trucking business responding to this boom in shipment volume by ordering a. Uh, yeah, historic amount or historic number of trucks last year, and the the orders peaked. Uh, these are these Class A heavy trucks that haul the uh, the big trailers across uh, the country, and uh, these orders peaked last uh, July and August uh, with over fifty thousand orders per per those months, and uh, uh, and now yeah, these, these trucks started arriving, uh, being delivered in. In late last year and early this year and being delivered now and so these deliveries are just piling up and this is happening while shipments are actually falling the uh, shipments of goods so now you have an increase in capacity and the increase in capacity from this year to last year is around eight percent so that you have an increase in capacity of eight percent and you have a, a decline in demand for, for trucks and uh, so trucking companies have responded and have slashed the orders, uh, and in 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 the last month, I mean it's, it's been going on all year, but uh, uh, last month they slashed them by eighty one percent compared to a year ago, and uh, to to less than ten thousand units is uh, the, the lowest since since the financial crisis. Um, so the new model years are now available, so you can put in orders for two thousand twenty trucks, and that's not happening. Uh, the, the 2019 trucks are still being delivered. Um, yeah, trucking companies are not ordering hardly anything. And the business is very cyclical. Uh, so far, sales are holding up. Now, it takes many months 
for uh, especially when there's a huge backlog like there was last year for for these trucks to from order to delivery, and it can take you know many months. And uh, so now the the trucks that are being delivered today, you know, they were ordered quite a bit uh, quite a few months ago, and and ordered last year, and and uh, you know it's a historic backlog that's not getting whittled down, and. Uh, so a, a sale uh, counts when when the vehicle is delivered. So his sales uh, reached uh, near record levels, the record having been just before the financial crisis. So uh, just earlier this year, sales by in terms of deliveries reached uh, near record levels, and uh, have stayed high except for the last couple of months. They've dropped now, and and so trucking manu- so truck manufacturers. Uh, they've been on cloud nine. You know, they've had this huge order boom last year. They've had this huge backlog that they can live off. And so they're cranking out these trucks and they're delivering them. Trucking companies in the United States, they're going now, the smaller Vita ones, they're going now out of business. So we've had a number of bankruptcy in recent months uh, because the business is suddenly getting really tough, really competitive. Uh, freight rates are coming down. Uh, there's too much capacity. There's not enough uh, demand. And any trucking company that's that's struggling or was struggling, uh, you know, gets gets run over essentially by by by, by this combination of, of facts. And so we've had uh, several. Uh, I mean, there's there's not a week goes by without a trucking company uh, filing for bankruptcy. And uh, uh, it, it, the the major trucking companies will be all okay, you know, but it's it's the smaller ones, uh, the the ones that have to rely on spot rates. Uh, that's particularly tough there because. Spot rates have come way down, uh, so there, there's a shakeout going on right now among uh, truckers, and it's it's a yeah it's a boom and bust business. There was a boom last year. Now now we're in the bust cycle. Um, this will eventually transfer to truck manufacturers, and they're, they're still working off the backlog. And the last uh, transportation re- recession we had, 2015, 2016, it took it, it kind of went the same way, except it wasn't quite as harsh. And uh, it took a long time for the backlog to get worked down. And then when the backlog was worked down, truck manufacturers started laying off people. So, uh, and, and their suppliers do too. The engine makers are like Cummins at layoffs. And, and, and this, this whole industry, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they got, you know, put themselves in a very defensive posture. And um, so right now the trucking uh, manufacturers and the industry is still saying, oh, sales are great, you know. But the the backlog, once it disappears, uh, will cause them to to cut production, and then eventually we'll see uh, layoffs go through that industry. Now that hasn't started yet, and it's uh, now I would say we're it may not start this year because the backlog is was really huge, and uh, they've gotten about half of that backlog down. There's still plenty left to to get us through the majority of this year, I think. Uh, before they, they, maybe into, into next year before they have to cut production. And, uh, uh, uh so it, it goes in that sequence. The trucking companies, uh, so the, 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 the people that own the trucks and, and there could be, uh, uh, owner operators and, and it could be the, the, some of the largest trucking companies out there. You know, they're dealing with the fallout right now. They're struggling with it. Uh, they've had all kinds of, uh, Earnings warnings come out already. Uh, the railroads are are in the same in the same boat, you know? so they're they're struggling, and especially when it comes to container deliveries. And uh, uh, the truck manufacturers, their turn will come later this year, early next year. So it, it goes through the industry like that, and and uh, yeah, it's boom and bust cycle. It's to be expected in this industry. Uh, there'll be another boom eventually, but before that happens, we'll have to we'll have to go through this bust and. Uh, let it, yeah, let it let it play out, and and that's what we're watching right now. Wolf, how can people get more information about Wolf Street? Wolfstreet.com. So it, everything is free. Uh, we don't we don't sell anything. Um, we uh, we analyze the various industries, and uh, we have a great active uh, discussion board. So uh, come join us. Well, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you, Jim. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Hilliard Macbeth, Wolf Richter, 
and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or our guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Now stand by for company showcase updates from American Manganese President Larry Ray, Abin Resources CEO Jim Pettit, and naturally splendid co-founder Craig Goodwin. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Well, Jim, it's great to be on the show. Larry, a lot of breaking news in the mining industry over the past week, one of them concerning cobalt. Yes, uh, that is a real significant uh, piece of news for uh uh, the battery manufacturers not great for them because the price will start to go up eventually. But that does uh, put spin a different light on the uh, overhang that's in the market in China. And I don't know how big that is. Nobody does, but uh, that's a significant cut. You know, I think I remember there's 130 or 140 thousand tons of uh, cobalt production a year, and that uh, that mine and in the Congo, uh, Butanda is uh, one of the is actually the largest uh, producer of uh, cobalt in the world. And uh, I've gone through some background on it. It looks like it could be doing about twenty one thousand uh, tons in the last uh, six months. And if that goes down, we are going to have a real shortfall, but I also came across uh, where Katango, which is another big producer, was slated for 26,000 tons this year, is uh, looking like it's going to only do about 14,000 tons. So there's another significant piece of uh, cobalt supply that's going off the market. Now, that should start to result in higher prices in cobalt. Uh, the uh, Matanda is slated to be down for two years. And uh, I don't think you're going to see it come back uh, much before that. Although that can change. I mean, if there was a significant rise in the price of uh, cobalt uh, in the next six to months to 12 months, that could change. And I would expect that it would. But on top of that... Uh, Indonesia is talking about the, or the Philippines, I mean, is talking about, or actually has already said they're going to be uh, cutting off a uh, production of high-grade nickel. And they're a significant producer of high-grade nickel. And uh, they have the largest, uh, they're the, actually the largest high-grade nickel supplier. So uh, if they shut that down and two of the big mines that they have there, that's going to put a squeeze on nickel. So, you know, these are two important ingredients in the lithium ion batteries. And of course, lithium is, uh, is a sluggard in this. I mean, lithium is, uh, you know, it's got a lot of production coming online and, uh, you know, it's going to take a little longer to regroup. I said this six months ago or even longer ago on a podcast that lithium was not going to be going up. And it basically has gone down ever since. But the uh, what's that mean for us? Well, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the recycled material, uh, cathode material from the batteries, is going to become a significant driver. And... Uh, we're finding that uh, we're getting contacted by companies that, uh, you know, that was on my wish list uh, a year ago, two years ago, or suddenly contacting us. And uh, so it shows you that this is spurring the action in the right direction. People are beginning to recognize that uh, recycling batteries is going to be a significant contributor to the cathode metals that are out there. And 
we are you know front and center on that. We hold patents in uh, in uh, a bit, well cradle to grave a recycling solution, and that's basically what people are going to need. The uh, the methods that they use now are going to be phased out, and they're going to have to find alternatives. And it was it was interesting when I was reading through the uh, announcement that uh, was put out by Glencore. They talked about 640 million uh, electric vehicles in uh, 2040. That is a tremendous amount of vehicles, and that tells me that uh, you know that you know. Do I think that we'll get it all? Probably no, not not in any way. But uh, we could get a significant portion of that, uh, or our process could be used in a significant portion of that. I'm not sure what the uh, what the uh, entire structure will look like at the end of the day, but in order to uh, capitalize on this, the company has got to uh, get a, a significant partner, uh, one that can say, okay, uh, you know, we plan on a five-year plan. We plan to have 50 plants out there at a certain size, and uh, that would certainly help the company become a capture. A large portion of that 640 million, because 50 plants will eventually turn into a thousand plants, and uh, so that's uh, that's basically what I'm seeing. And the perception, of course, has changed, which I uh, mentioned in my previous podcast, and uh, what uh, recycling is all about. And uh, everybody always said that uh, it wasn't worth the effort. It was uh, there was no money in it, and everything else. And we've shown that there is money in it, and a significant amount of money. And not only that, but uh, you know, our, we don't have any carbon footprint in this, and uh, that's important. Uh, the carbon footprint, which doesn't exist in our uh, cradle to grave solution, so. We're starting to get some attention in the market, which is uh, sorely needed. Uh, we were kind of like the Lone Ranger out there, and you know, talking about recycling for the last two years, two and a half years, and uh, you know, we just weren't getting garrying attention that we needed because the perception was that it wasn't needed. And now that perception is changing rapidly, and you can see it uh, in the activity in uh, in uh, Amy's market. So. So all I can say is that I got a smile from year to year. I mean, <laughs> the reality is that uh, I think we're on a uh, on a path here that is only going to get better as we move through. And speaking of that, we should be able to announce the uh, and may have a, start announcing things next week. And uh, you know, we've had a kind of a uh, paucity of news releases in the last uh, six weeks or so, so this is going to put us back on to having regular news releases, and uh, and we're going to be really busy with the companies doing due diligence on us over the next several months, and uh, starting next week. So, and we're getting all kinds of conference calls. It's unbelievable. And uh, the, the names, that, as I mentioned earlier, the names, the household names that I was uh, hoping would be contacting us are now doing so. And, uh, you know, I, I can only see things going plus, 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 plus for us. So that said and done, uh, Jim, I think uh, basically I wish our shareholders and our listeners a, a great weekend. I'm going to have a great weekend. I feel good about it. And... Uh, the uh, uh, there's not much more. I mean, what more can you say? There's two big events that have happened in the last week, and uh, with the cobalt market and the nickel market, that only helps our cause. So uh, there's not much more I can say about that. Larry, where are you traded, and under what symbols? We're traded on the uh, on the uh, Toronto Venture Exchange under the symbol AMY. We're traded in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF, and we're traded in Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. Uh, you can do due diligence on the company by going to our uh, website, AmericanManganeseInc.com, or you can phone me direct at uh, 778-574-4444 or email me 
L R E A U G H at A M Y M N dot com. Larry, thanks for the update. You're welcome. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on August 9th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Abbott Resources. Welcome back to the show, Jim. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, the company's come out with uh, another news release. Uh, what's in it? Well, it was basically an update uh, on our progress of our drilling on the Forest Kerr, as well as uh, what's been going on uh, since we stopped drilling on the Justin. It's you know, uh, the forest curves coming along really good. Um, at this point in time, we're, as of today, well, as of that news release, we're on our ninth hole at, at just over 3,000 meters. As of today, we're, we're over 4,000 meters and, uh, on our 11th hole. And, you know, we're, we're on to something. We started out by testing, uh, to the north of the north boundary zone, which is that high grade zone we've been working on the last few years. Um, and then we went down just south, and we're testing a zone um, kind of to the east and a bit south of the old Naranda Hole, which was 200 meters to the south of the north boundary. So we're now about 500 meters south of the north boundary zone, and we're into something there. So, you know, consequently, we're now on our fifth hole in that zone. And initially we were only going to do two, but we're on to something. And we've got some rush assays in. We'd like to get some data back so that we can make sure that we're spending our money wisely. Um, it looks good. It looks like a zone that could be closer to a so-called feeder, um, a source. Anyways, it, and, and it appears bigger. So, you know, we're pretty happy with what we're seeing so far. And then as far as the Justin goes, where we finished drilling, we've just sent back about 40 um, samples back for reassay in another lab because we weren't we weren't really um, happy with the results that we got there. It didn't make sense to the geos, I guess is really the right way to put it. Um, when you visually see uh, the uh, core coming out, you know you're in really good zone. You know you're in sulfides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're just going back to reconfirm. And that we should have info back there probably uh, mid to latter part of next week, um, so we can be a little more definitive when we put out news. Uh, in the meantime, we're going to keep going uh, in Forest Kerr, and I suspect we will have some initial results to talk about at the beginning of next week, maybe the mid beginning to mid. So it's going really well. Jim, for people new to Abbott Resources, where is all this action taking place and what does your company specifically do? Well, we are in the gold exploration business. Um, we prefer to be in safe juris political jurisdictions, so the Forest Curve Project is in the northwest quadrant of British Columbia called the Golden Triangle, which is uh, quite a unique place to operate in, uh, known for its high grade. Um but there's been several deposits historically developed there, and, and uh, there's some new ones going on with Red Chris to the north of us, and just to the south is Predium with the Bruce Jack. Um, and then you've got the Yukon, where Justin is, and uh, that project is tied right on to Golden Predator, and uh, another good, safe jurisdiction to be in. So that's what we do. We're in the gold market, and uh, the gold business, and it's a good time to actually be in at gold is up two hundred dollars since the mid May, so um, and it's still moving. I think it's got a ways to go. Where is Abin traded and under what symbols? Uh, it's traded uh, on the uh, sorry the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol ABN. It's under also in the U.S. OTCQB market ABNAF, and in Frankfurt it's listed under the symbol E2L2. 
And where can people get more information about Abbott? Well, our website's a really good one, um, which you can go to, you know, abbottresources.com. That'll pop up. And uh, if you want more information, you can always contact um, Don Myers, 604-687-3376. Jim, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome. Anytime. I've been speaking with Jim Pettit, CEO and President of Abbott Resources. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on August 7th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Craig Goodwin, president and co-founder of Naturally Splendid. Welcome back to the show, Craig. Good morning, Jim. Craig, it's been a couple of weeks since we last spoke. What's new down there? Well, we've had a, a very busy couple of weeks, Jim. Um, we had some news out um, on the 8th of August, just yesterday, in regards to a CBD extraction system that we are leasing to Prairie Pure, which is going to be commissioned in Oregon State. This most recent build-out in Oregon State uh, basically shows the direction that Naturally Splendid is heading. In the last few weeks, we've announced the deal with Prairie Pure, which is for extraction in the United States. We announced a deal with Alternameds, which is an Ontario-based company with a confirmation of readiness um, processing license that we will be building out a facility in Ontario. And we also announced our Safe Quality Food Level 2 certification or SQF Level 2 certification here in Pitt Meadows. What that allows us to do now is to have extraction services in both Canada and the United States as well as a certified food manufacturing facility here in Pitt Meadows, British Columbia. As we continue to build out our infrastructure, we will then add, of course, the edible component into this business strategy. It will be a fully vertically integrated company at that time. We will have our own hemp processing, we will have our own extraction capacity, and as importantly, we will be a food manufacturing company as well as an edible manufacturing company. So it has, in fact, been a very busy two weeks. Craig, where are you traded and under what symbols? Actually, we're traded on three exchanges. Uh, On the TSX, we are NSP. In the States, on the OTCQB, our symbol is NSPDF. And in Frankfurt, we, we trade under the symbol 50N. And for people who are new to Naturally Splendid, what are you all about? You know what? The best place to find that information is on our website, which is www.naturallysplendid.com. Uh, we have our investor deck as well as company profile there. But Naturally Splendid has been in the hemp business for over a decade. We've had a food manufacturing facility that's been operating in BC for over a decade. And now we're going to marry those two areas of expertise into a opportunity that can capitalize on the emerging edible um, markets here in Canada and, in fact, abroad. Craig, thank you so much for the update. Thank you very much for your time, Jim. Look forward to talking to you again soon. I've been speaking with Craig Goodwin. He's the president and co-founder of Naturally Splendid. I'm Jim Goddard. Our conversation took place on August 9th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.